A, sig a significant land area of Australia has lower agricultural value in production under traditional farming systems. Also, the land holding, as Eddie has just mentioned, of the Indigenous estate covers up to 42% of Australia's land mass. So how can we aggregate the lost agricultural land for high value, high quality production? That was the theme that we started off with. Under the aggregator model, farmers will enter an agreement with an aggregator company to take underutilized portions of the property and production available for aggregation. The aggregator company, which will be a medium-sized business, will be responsible for consistently providing and producing to premium meals manufactured through the managing of end-to-end -end agricultural supply chain. So what we have here in the diagram is the utilization of marginal land that we propose that can be utilized using technology. Um, the Reason Group, we've entered into a joint venture with uh, UTAS in Hobart with uh, their sensoring platform and deployed sensors which they had developed as part of a government grant program into improving agricultural production. So in the diagram you can see there's different components of this. There's the animal production on the marginal land, the vegetable production to go in the meal, the robotic processing at the abattoir, the logistics, and eventually the supply of the actual meals to Asia. Throughout the 1980s, uh, local Ab Aboriginal land councils began pulling money and buying stations. Today, these stations produce rangeland goats for live sale without the investment available to value add. Hence, the returns to the farm gate are strictly limited. What's needed is a collaborative approach to farming the rangeland goat population to produce protein for the aggregator model. The Aboriginal community will manage and improve the properties currently under the management of the local Aboriginal Land Council to boost productivity and ensure sustainability. In addition, this rangeland initiative will increase new opportunities for the region, increase the volume and value of agricultural exports, showcase the initiative approaches and technologies and perpetuate traditional Aboriginal land management techniques. What we found in our investigation is that there's a very strong desire from the ILC regional constituents to actually manage the land first. So in a lot of these um, operations that they're now on, there, there's a period of land, re ra land regeneration that has to start before any actual animal production can take place on the properties. And you just heard from our speakers the imperative that demand for products must be at the forefront of any decision to increase production. In this case, there's a large market for goat meat and goat meat products. And goat products have a high return for export. The creation of a protein supply will feed the aggregator model in producing high-end meals to Asia, raising returns at the farm gate even further. Uh, some of you may be aware of the global demand for goat meat. It's uh, probably the largest uh, opportunity in terms of what we have for this type of um, project. The number of wild goats to start the population and the, the actual farming end of things is quite sustainable. So it's a fairly quick operation to get started. The model can be scaled and rolled out over the underutilized and non-optimized agricultural areas throughout Australia. What are the opportunities? The farming of rangeland and feral animals combined with greater processing will generate income for the local area, as we see here. The farming and harvesting of the animals which currently flourish in the areas can result in a su sustainable output for the land as compared with traditional farming methods. The establishment of income training and employment with an aggregator model will lead to improved situations and growth in the indigenous business. The goat population in Australia has been steadily increasing with subsequent impacts of the environment. The control of the population through farming and harvesting will improve environmental outcomes. Butchering and production of goat meat products rather than exporting the live animals has the 
potential to bring a higher return based on the limited agricultural capacity of the rangeland areas. Employment opportunities in rangeland areas tends to be low. The implementation of an aggregator model will bring in employment directly through farming and factory processing, as well as further downstream employment. The case study here summarizes the, the benefits that we have the regional income. We can use the lost agricultural land. We have indigenous empowerment. Existing animal population can be harvested. And we're moving into a higher value agricultural product. And of course, new jobs in the regional area. So I'd like to ask the um, panel a question, and this will start off the general questions from the audience. What must Australia do to ensure it is producing high value, high quality products that are in demand and that we are competitively positioned to deliver? How will we ensure we are producing the right products in the right areas if, no, if one or more aspects are being competitive or missing, how could we or should we address them? I'm happy to go first. Um, I, I, Frank, I, I, in, uh, in the model, uh, there is a, an assumption there that uh, the demand for the product, uh, the protein uh, delivered from uh, the, the goat uh, production is uh, uh, is there, and, and I think that that uh, certainly that uh, goes without saying that that would need to be uh, very, very carefully assessed, as it would be. Um, but the other thing that I think is extremely important, of course, is uh, uh, the condition of the land, um, and uh, the land may in fact need regeneration, um, as, as Eddie has, uh, has mentioned, and it's assumed there in the model. But associated with that is the cost of production. Uh, and, and I don't think there is a real, um, uh, the, the, there isn't a real point in the, uh, in the presentation there so far about, it's fine to say there's a market there, but will this system deliver the, uh, the protein into the market at a competitive rate? And uh, unfortunately, uh, many times that great ideas fall down because the cost of production are too high. So I think that that is something that would need to be taken into consideration right up front. I might pick up on the, the jobs aspect and, you know, I absolutely agree with Peter that you've actually got to have the, the demand there. But there does need to be an investment in rural areas. And, and the training needs to be more along the train the trainer. So it's not about bringing that training in... Um, from a city and saying, well, people need to go to the city to be trained and hope that they will then go and, and live in a rural area. People will actually go to those areas where the jobs are available. So there, if, if there is a demand for jobs, um, they will go there initially for the work, but then what follows is they will not stay there unless they have got access to adequate health and education services. And even if they do stay, you'll have what you have in a lot of mining uh, areas, which is completely a FIFO type of environment because the families won't come unless you have that other support structure. Yet on the other hand, um, if we see some of the areas um, around the Pilbara where they have actually developed those communities, the training is in the towns themselves. They've got access to good health and education. Now that has, has come over time, but that has in, in return meant that you've got high levels of production and you've got the ability to supply at a high price. I don't disagree with anything they said. I think it's um, uh, the question uh, for me anyway leads uh, again to look at this as a as a project, um, and whether the governments have that capability and industry writ large to or as Inc as I call it to look at it in this way. But I think what is missing for me and um, in uh, getting a greater understanding of of how we go forward on this is is what is the the information base that we want to launch all of, all of our efforts and our investments from. Um, what mapping has been undertaken that, that tells us uh, that we're able to get into a GIS system that allows us to look at the specification of a specific area in, in a, whether it's Indigenous land or non-Indigenous land, 
and we, we speak about in a generic sense in terms of ownership uh, in, this, in this discussion that uh, if I was going to invest in, a, in, um, in an area around agribusiness in, in Australia, I'd certainly want to know what is the best area to produce a specific product. Um, where do we go to get the, um, the, the information that tells us about the, uh, the soil composition? Um, and what is the, the specifications of the soil and the rainfall that, that comes into that area? Um, whether it's all built into a, into a system that allows us to interrogate the system in order to make that investment decision. Um, uh, the other thing is, is, of course, do we understand the, the, the geological structures underneath the, the surface in terms of um, well enough to understand uh, the ability to, to capture water, draw water, recharge it, and what is this going to take uh, in, in terms of uh, investing over a long lead time. And, the, and the, the other thing that I think is missing in the discussion here is, is that uh, land and agribusiness and farming is um, the world that I live in. We, we use what we call the term is life of mind models. Well, this is almost life of life model for the country. And how do we move our thinking into a life of life thinking so that we're investing in the long term and not the short term? So that governments, um, whether it's a Liberal government or a Labor government, have, a, have an agreed arrangement that the country is what is the most important thing. And that investing in a mapping exercise that tells us exactly what it is we've got um, in order to meet the demands of the, the various commodity cycles as they fall and rise uh, based on demand from our near neighbours. I think is, is something that we need to spend a lot of time thinking about and investing in that front end work. I think, Eddie, you pick up on a really important point, and that's investing in the data. In the absence of good quality data, you're not going to be able to make the sort of decisions that will get the best outcomes. And so, you know, we hear it so often we need evidence based policy. Well, evidence comes from having good data sets. Yeah, I agree. I, I watched a, I don't know if anyone see it, did I? I spent weekends looking at things, and it was the, at the economic forum at Davos, and um, uh, the uh, the Jewish guy who's wrote the book on Sapiens and Homo Deus, and he's now writing the one on 21 Reasons for the 21st Century, and he he spoke about that, and um, he talked about uh, data and information, and the control of data, and who has it, and the danger we face is is that data may not be at our disposal as readily as it is today, even though it may be disconnected, and that there is, there is a, a, um, a very big business case for managing and controlling data. Um, and the two biggest is Amazon, Facebook, Google, um, and um, when you look at their business model, they don't actually produce anything. Uh, yet they're the three wealthiest groups in the world. Um, so data and management of data, access to data so that you can make informed investment decisions is going to become very critical going forward. And this is where government needs to sit down and think about how they uh, restrict multinationals or even individuals from controlling data from the farmer. I think... Um I think um, uh, Eddie touched on a really important point, uh, and that is that for this approach to be sustainable a longer term, there needs to be commitment from uh, from governments of all persuasions to to commit long term to a process, um, and uh, and that I don't think could be overstated as well. Agreed, and uh, I, sorry, Sue, but you know the the other thing is, you know, do we spend enough time looking at the forward curve, and what is the forward curve? Um, uh, what what's our investment uh, mandate here? Um, ultimately, is it just to simply get in and make um, a quick profit? Uh, what are we handing forward? That certainly occupies my mind because of the two positions I'm in. But if I'm in the private sector, profit is my main driver. Because right? I've got shareholders to please and I've got to return a dividend. And in all of this, if we're going to have um, sustained uh, agribusiness that's going to produce high-quality products, 
Where, where is the discussion now around biosecurity? Um, what is the discussion on around biosecurity? What are we going to ha hand forward? And you're only going to look at the United States at the moment, and one of the big studies that's come out of there is um, water filtration. It's costing them three times it, to filtrate water now because they've stripped all the land than it did 30 years ago. Um, so what is the balancing here to get long-term quality food products to meet the fibre demand uh, of the future? I don't think it's about now. I think it's about the next 30 and beyond. And in this, the foundational settings, as I, as I talk about, for the Indigenous estate need to be put in place for the whole of Australia in this regard. Thank you, panel. Now I'll open up for questions from the audience. Dave Schelling from ABES. Um, just picking up on the model that was looking at uh, high-tech high processing. So I've heard a lot over the last couple of days about wages and being a significant cost to business. Um, and robotic factories are a really good way of cutting those wages costs. Problem is, take, picking up Sue's point about the soft infrastructure and the healthcare and the rest, you need a critical mass in a community before those sorts of things become accessible, become economic. How do you reconcile, and opening up to everyone, how do you reconcile the, the need to reduce workforce and thus wages input costs with the need to, um, to, to build those communities? And where are the jobs actually going to come from in that model? I'll go first. Um, certainly a, a, a good point. But um, if you look at the production system that's outlined up there, uh, there's there's certainly a very significant amount associated, or very uh, serious amount of, of effort um, and focus on delivering the goats, in this case, uh, into that processing facility. And there is certainly going to be need for a lot of human involvement, uh, a lot of labour to ensure that, that that happens, whether it's in the goat management, whether it's in the land management, um, infrastructure, uh, uh, logistics, moving the goats to the processing facility, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I think what what this model picks up on that there's a move towards robotics in processing animals anywhere, anyway, right around the world, and it's not all about labour. There's also about quality, safety, a whole lot of, of very, very important issues. So that trend is, is happening regardless. But I think the opportunity to build the communities, which Sue quite rightly picked up on, um, is the job opportunities associated with the production system overall. And, and I agree, it, it is that broader system. Um, because when you talk about jobs, it's just that the nature of the jobs may change. The number of jobs are likely to increase. And I can give you a real life example. Um, in the renewable energy area up in the north where a factory is being considered that is primarily about robotics, so jobs that traditionally would have been in manual manufacturing will go to robotics, but where the jobs are coming from are coming from the R&D that is going towards that, the investment in a lot of R&D, the investment that is going to come from down the supply chain in the additional jobs, and then what will come from secondary services that will need to be delivered there. So in terms of absolute jobs, there would be more jobs than would have been associated with a traditional type of manufacturing uh, plant, um, given that it is very high tech. Yep, I don't disagree with any of that. The way that I'd like to couch in my response is that there are three, three primary areas of impact for us going forward as a nation. One is obviously the markets itself, the environment, and Moore's law. So we're talking about Moore's law, which is technological development. And what is the right balance between technological development and productive human beings? I don't think we've even discussed that. Um, because we can look back over time and uh, look at a continuum from the Industrial Revolution to now, and we, we can see that with, with Moore's law being applied to that, uh, human employment has just gone up. But we've now arrived at this point in time where Moore's law takes us into a whole new paradigm where machines are capable of doing just about everything that we do now. Um, and how does then 
uh, that relate to the productivity of human beings and, and jobs. So I'm speaking in a much more bigger overview to this. Uh, and the lead time to that, I think, is much narrower than most people think because technology is changing at such a rate that we can't even imagine today what's going to be around in 10 years' time. And if it's true uh, that the banks are going to, in the financial sector, which is the biggest sector in this country, um, are going to reduce, I think, it's about 30,000 people over the next uh, five uh, to 10 years and will be replaced only with 5,000 people, where does that 25,000 go? Or where does that 30,000 go? Because the new generation coming through are all the tech savvy. Um, these are questions that, that go beyond just simply uh, the, the political paradigm, the, the stewardship. It needs, it needs the type of thinking uh, that, dare I say it, probably existed in a period that no longer exists today, where we need people who will stop and think about the country first, they will stop and think about the people first because there's an old saying, and I heard it again today, my mother used to say it to me all the time, idle, idle hands is the devil's playground. And what they will do is that you might gain here, but you've got this bigger impost happening over here, which is a social impost. And it doesn't matter how much you invest in, it's going to cost you to buggery over here. And we, we need a lot of critical thinking around this um, because it... It's not going to affect us, but it's going to affect your grandchildren and your grandchildren. Yep. Um, James Hawkins with Nuffield Australia. Um, I'm a farmer and involved in ag investment and development. Um, I'll probably concentrate a bit more around the, the cost side of investment. Um, obviously, we're a high cost producing country. Um, my question is around labour supply. Uh, it follows on a little bit from the last question, but um, are we getting the policy levers right um, when it comes to migration and, and maintaining um, enough labour supply and, and talent to foster the investment that we want going forward, I suppose? Maybe I can start with that one. The, the, the model attempts to demonstrate that the, the labour content is basically at the beginning and at the end. At the beginning, there's a significant labor content for the land management, the animal management, and the whole eco-process around that. Uh, because I don't think it's um, a surprise to anybody the, the amount of effort Australia will have to invest in the land regeneration component. It's a real big thing. At the other end, at the factory end, as everybody knows from the demise of the car industry, we've got a lot of empty factories and a lot of unemployed people who used to work in the factory. So the actual processing part at the end will occupy a relatively large number of people as well. The part in the middle through the abattoir, the robotics, logistics and so on, and the high-tech platform and so on that sits in the middle to drive it is really inconsequential to the way the thing works. So we see the actual employment at the front and at the end. Just to uh, add to that, uh, you made a comment that really applied on a, on a broader basis um, in regard to immigration settings and employment, unemployment. Uh, in my ideal world, uh, we would have zero unemployment in, uh, in this country. Uh, we'd have everyone with a, with a, uh, a job uh, that was improving the standard of living, uh, including their own standard of, of living, and we wouldn't rely on, uh, on labour from uh, offshore uh, bases. Uh, but, but the reality is that there are gaps, currently gaps, in, uh, in our employment uh, opportunities that are being full, filled at this stage by people from overseas through various programs. And, and I think that short term it's important that they be maintained, but secondly, that they be reviewed on a very, very regular basis. And that governments are prepared to take uh, the really brave step of going out and focusing uh, 
education in areas where it's really going to be required longer term. And that's, that's a pretty tough ask, but it's really going to be important going forward for us. And I'm prepared to take it just by throwing in a grenade. Um, the reality is I don't think we're getting the policy settings right because I think we're hiding behind an immigration debate that is more around people's perceptions and views and plays to things such as terrorism rather than having a debate about what are the different labour needs for the different sectors at what point in time and taking a longer term view about that and how do we actually uh, get a, a framework where we can look at how you can continue to keep an eye on how that balance changes. And I'll give you an example. In the area of aged care, we are going to need tens of thousands of people to be able to fill that gap, and we are not going to be able to fill it domestically. And we need to be having that debate now with an ageing population. And yet we still keep hiding behind um, a political discussion about this. So, you know, that's my view and where we need to get to. Um, I've got to tell you, I don't turn a lot of my time to this particular matter um, because, it, it, um, for me, people are people and I don't particularly care where they come from so long as if they do turn up and they do want to come to this country and they want to live in this country along with everybody else, then we just get on with what we're supposed to be doing. Um, whether the policy settings are right, um, I don't really have a, a view on that. Um, what I do think is, is that... We, we still haven't come to terms with where we're going as a country. Um, we, we spend a lot of time articulating that the next wave of, um, of jobs is going to come out of the, the STEM platform, which is the science, technology, engineering and mathematics, and that there is this, you know, this great rush to go forward on that, yet you, the country is underwritten by, effectively, people who work the land, people who have um, lived on the, um, the, the fine line of um, social well-being um, and nothing is more exemplified in, the, in the, uh, the business enterprise sector where generally the small, small to medium-sized businesses is the largest component in this country and pay the most tax, yet they're the most penalised. Uh, so to me, um, immigration, I think, is a very necessary part of any country, particularly this country. We have a land mass, as I've already articulated how big it is. The land itself is underutilised. Um, but it comes down to, the, to what I simply call the town planners. Um, they are clogging to death Melbourne and Sydney. Um, I mean, every time you land in Sydney, it takes you nearly an extra 10 minutes to get to where you're going. And, you know, I go there almost every week. Um, and uh, getting into Melbourne is just as difficult and you land in Brisbane and you don't know whether... You certainly don't drive down the Australian street because they change the traffic lights and it's, you know, you're going one way um, and, it's, and it's a goddamn mess. So true. Right? So, I mean, these are the simple things that I see as I go ar around the country and yet we are so focused on uh, a political debate ar around immigration. Well, you know... If we can't get it right with what we've got already, maybe we do need to bring in some other people to help us. Greg Harper from University of Melbourne Commercial. Um, I was really excited by the case study. I wanted to sort of put another lens onto it. When I think about the landmass of Australia and the incredible diversity of species and environments and soils in there, I think about you know, the agricultural practices of the Aboriginal community and our predecessors, and you know, they found ways of, of pulling protein out of those different environments, very creative ways. I actually think about your platform, which is you know, ultimately delivering high value meals, but perhaps you've only considered one species that you're actually starting with, and there may in fact be thousands of species that are quite appropriate for harvest. I think about the, the way particularly the Canadians have approached this global protein business by effectively getting around problems of pea protein flavour and saying that all of the products, you know, so many products are just based generically on pea protein. Well, perhaps we should be arguing, you know, there's, let's say, a hundred sources of protein that can 
most appropriately come from Australian landscapes in a sustainable way, but they all get delivered in uh, a high, you know, a high gourmet form through the sorts of mechanisms you're talking about. I wonder what your reaction to that is. Yes, the, we've had discussions with uh, CSIRO on this type of topic that um, obviously with the concept we can move into other fields as you correctly identify. And certainly there was a talk here about insects, for example, which is a hot topic at the moment, and uh, the processing and so on of that is not really any different to the, the goods and so on. So there are many opportunities for this. And, and this is why we really geared this whole project to the ILC and the concept, because that's where we believe the knowledge is. The knowledge to regenerate the land and the knowledge for the other applications that sit in that sector. So we've spent quite a bit of time experimenting and discussing and looking into this. And we certainly believe that that's the correct way to start this. The other part of it, the factory and the logistics and so on, are fairly straightforward and so on. But we see the real thought leadership being at the front end of this uh, opportunity. I'd probably add that um, certainly there is potential opportunities uh, from a whole range of, of uh, sources, whether it be protein or, uh, or, or other nutrients, um, and absolutely uh, agree that they should be explored. And this, this model gives you the opportunity to, to do that in a sustainable way. Um, but, but I think we've also got to be careful uh, that we don't start uh, installing a whole heap of infrastructure um, setting up a whole lot of industries that aren't sustainable uh, from an economic perspective. So uh, the whole process has to be applied each time uh, and make sure that the market's there, make sure the market's sustainable, make sure the production, is, we're capable of the production, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, You don't, you don't uh, uh, see shortcuts once you've got this particular system in place. You can learn from it but you've got to be prepared to do it all again. Rosemary Lott from ABES. Um, firstly, I want to agree with Eddie's comment that I think, um, particularly in the area, your case study around Wilcannia, which is very, very dry a lot of the time, and then occasionally gets a major flood down the Darling, um, and has a whole lot of probably potentially quite interesting uh, groundwater issues below. I think that that analysis of the land and its capability and how it can be used really should start with that. Um, and we do have some data. It would be challenges in putting it together, but um, I think that would be a good place to start. Um, I'd also just make a comment that I think perhaps um, in thinking who Australia is and what it wants to be going forward, we shouldn't shy away from acknowledging some of the costs that um, if you like are hidden, for example, the amount spent on welfare or the amount spent on public health, and should that investment be redirected to actually addressing the underlying problems rather than the symptoms. Um, yes, yeah, so I wondered if um, along those lines, if you had further comment about were this to be a real case study, uh, or once, you know, what would you tackle in terms of addressing the local issues that are, that are the problems that are already there? If we start from what are the problems rather than let's, we, we just want this, this trade outcome of selling goats. And so goats are one of the local problems, um, but there are others as well. So how do, we, how do we have this model where we're actually addressing the local problems to get the solutions that are appropriate? Sue, do you want to start? Um, look absolutely agree that you've got to start with the problem. And I think that's where, um, in models like this and, and, and how it can be, be replicated, uh, that co-design where you're actually speaking to people at the local level and say, so they're actually helping to identify what's the problem for them, because the problem for them may be quite different from the problem that a centralised policy uh, unit may be thinking of. And they will actually come up with a suite of solutions that can be put in place over a period of time that may actually not be considered 
once again from a centralised view. So very supportive of we've always got to start with the problem. We've actually got to look at co-design and we've got to look at making sure that we can not necessarily jump to a either a regulatory solution but look at a solution that may be out of the box, that may come once again at the local level um, and can be quite innovative at that because otherwise we just go back to doing the things we've always done and it just stymies innovation. <laughs> the way that I'd um, think about it is, is that um, over the years, at least since I was a young boy, we've, we've overcomplicated everything. Um, you take um, just simply going to the doctor, uh, you've got a problem, and if you want to see a specialist, then you can only go and see the, the GP, and then he can re on refer you to the specialist. Um, and so everything we, we do in this world at the moment is, is that uh, the, the access to data with, uh, with, a, with a problem that you want to fix is not centralised so that you can interrogate the data and you can explode the data. So if you're a, um, an investor and you want to look at um, the country um, and you want to uh, look at what are the contiguous arrangements of all the plots of ownership of land relevant to uh, infrastructure and then determine what's stranded versus not uh, stranded um, and what's it going to take to take stranded land uh, into being viable because of infrastructure development. There's, there's no overlay to that that I can immediately go to a system to give me those sorts of investigations. Um, and the investment, as I said earlier, up the front end on all of the things that, that we talk about here hasn't been pulled together in a way that says, where do we want to be in 30 years' time? What do we need to build now, knowing that over the 30 years, uh, the actual uh, metrics are going to change, the demand on, on matters are going to change, the actual design of the system is going to change, the information sets are going to change, but it gives, it gives a proponent developer or a person that's going to come in and, and um, uh, fix a problem uh, the opportunity to, uh, to um, apply a much greater scope of work and thinking around it. For me, I'd like to put it in, in just as a snapshot to finalise on this question is what we are missing, in my view, is, is, a, is, a, is, an, is the architecture to all of this. And how is it wire framed up? And what are the mechanics in order to deliver all of this going forward? That, to me, is, is missing. And my approach in this comes from the mining sector. We drill, we, we find a resource, and then uh, we, we connect it all up. We wire frame the the, the all body together in order to make it economic. There shouldn't be any different to how we're approaching agri agriculture or the agribusiness. Um, and we know the, the mechanics that are going to go into that to extrapolate it at a certain cost in order to make money from it. Uh, I don't think we do the same in, in a, quite a lot of things, particularly in the agribusiness. One final question. Thank you. This is a question to Eddie. It's Cathy Robinson from CSRO. Well, we are starting to think about some of those, um, you know, technical assessments of land estate um, and water um, estate and thinking about how that could enable Indigenous development in partnership with those communities. But what I'm really struck by is that when you do those bottom-up approaches, there's all a very mosaic approach. It's not just goats. Mm. It's goats plus. Mm. You know, it's got, you know, goats plus, you know, a conservation reserve and a carbon farm and a you know, all on an IPA land. So I was just thinking about connecting tenures here, you know, so you're thinking about the I Indigenous um, ILC estate. How does that nest itself into the region? So can we do better across tenure, um, do you think? And if so, in terms of how data could help with that, what's some areas of data we need to think about? We could spend all night talking about this, but look, uh, the what we're, what we're dealing with is 40 years, 30 years, of property rights and human rights uh, evolving over time. And there's been this scattergun, hodgepodge delivery of all these assets around the country. And even the purchasing, a lot of it is not contiguous. In other words, it hasn't been uh, planned out in a way so that we can bundle this all together. The same way we'd, uh, that Peter has talked about 
uh, let's not get into investing for the sake of investing. Uh, let's look at regions and, and decide what it is that they can produce and uh, see how the, the contiguous arrangements of these plots of lands, whether it's Indigenous or non-Indigenous, can be bundled up into an infrastructure uh, platform so that you can get uh, products to market. Uh, and the, the overall uh, benefits uh, through that will, will allow uh, the logistics from gate to, to plate type arrangements be uh, have greater opportunity to lower your uh, your um, your overall costs. And I know I don't know how they do it in the agri business, but you know I don't know whether you design the uh, the model around your production costs as your C1 costs and then your C2 costs and uh, whether or not you've got debt overhang in it and you amortise it all through and you've got abnormals getting into your three C3s and then, which is your my favourite, the taxation department, um, and um, and then obviously you end up with what you end up with. Um, so I'm not sure that um, we spend enough time around that and the impacts of C1 to C3 and how does the government in its policy and its microeconomic reform uh, can be brought to bear on this to incentivise investment to drive this growth? We did have a question which I missed up here. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, Lorraine Gordon from the Farm Co-ops and Collaboration Program, known as Farming Together. Um, look, as an economic ecologist, I must say on the case study, and it mirrors a couple of comments that have already been made here, I would really question um, in an arid area that is quite brittle, going down the goat meat path. Um, and there is a lot of other options for that sort of country, so I'd, I'd question it from an economic point of view. I'd, I'd very much question it from the ecology um, angle. And then I, I would like to make the comment that at some stage we need to flip this conversation around to stop extracting from these uh, brittle areas all the time and talking about extracting stuff because... I think there comes a time. I mean, to be able to re rehabilitate that sort of country is going to take a very long time. So perhaps, you know, there needs to be a lot of options put on the table, if any at all, to be, to be constantly looking at, at extracting stuff from that sort of country. Thank you. The purpose was to be thought-provoking and uh, put the idea out there to get people's views and opinions and so on. And I think the interesting thing that came up is that if goats are not the right idea, perhaps insects are the way to go. So, who knows? Um, well, it comes this time for me to wrap up. And thank you for uh, your attendance. And on behalf of uh, Reason Group and Abios, I thank our panelists for the effort and contribution they made today. And join me in giving them a round of applause.